Well, we talked a minute ago about the former fearless leader of the WWE, Vince McMahon, and <laughs> Brian, for so many years, at all. If we were to lose Vince, and for many years it was true, that we'd be f***ed, but now they've lost Vince, Vince ain't welcome, and they're on a f***ing roll. Raw, on April Fool's Day, April the 1st, of course, April, the April Fool's TV show is on Wednesday nights, but on April Fool's Day, they fooled Brooklyn with the 13th straight TV sellout. Was that 15,000 people, or however many was that? Um, and another, they've got the stars and they're doing the angles and they're, they're doing adult shit and trying to simulate and, and coming closer than in quite some time, the violence of the attitude era. And they're fixing to do a goddamn, you know, mega show while the other guys are maybe still doing mega show. What'd you think of raw Monday night? I've enjoyed Raw, mostly, obviously, because of the segments that are not wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> because none of the matches are really with any of the things that are happening. But the happening segments with the happening people are great. They're happening. And the production, it has to be said, this is more than just, there's a new director. There's a new feel. There's a new look. And it feels more fresh. And a lot of the backstage stuff. and just the shots in the crowd and coming into the building and the way everything's being done has just made this whole show more watchable. Yeah, the, the guy and see a lot of people that were Kevin Dunn, he boy, he's the one that's doing the, the quick zoom ins and outs and the goofy cuts and everything. No, he, that was his vision. He, Kevin Dunn wasn't the actual director. He hired the people that would do that. he, but they, all the camera people, the directors, the technical staff were doing his vision because he was head of production. And even though he was smart enough to hire younger people as time went on that knew, because he started, he never worked anywhere but there, but the WWF slash E. And he was a 20-year-old kid when he started. His father was you know, a, a local television guy that had been involved with Vince and was doing their program back back then. And he's never been anywhere else, so he was hiring younger people that would give him ideas or suggestions, but he couldn't see. It's not like he came from network sports. It's not like he came from HBO or NFL films. You have to be able to see this kind of shit in your head as the director of production or head of production, whatever the title is that they've got. And then you need to be able to find people. You can't just have some fucking cameraman that you pick up for, you know, $250 in Cleveland that can do the sweeping shot where he's taking the steady cam through the fucking concourse and into the arena or whatever. You have to get people that know how to execute the look. And even if you, if you rehearse ahead of time in a production meeting the camera angles for a certain promo and the the expressions that you want to get or the the facial expression that the wrestling producers tell you they want to see in a finish you've got to have crack people and then the director whoever he's got directing it's a live broadcast and i'm sure he's got i don't know how many cameras they're using in totality with some backstage and some wherever, but they've got at least six or eight on the ring, I think, between handhelds and whatever. So the director is sitting there watching eight television screens at the same time at minimum and calling the shots to the technical director, who's the guy who actually punches the buttons. Camera four, ready, camera four, take four. Over and over and over, these are highly talented people and it looks like it's looking ever more like a fucking you know high quality network production and when network tv had some cachet to it back in the day well it's the production and the presentation because like you know the backstage interviews it's being presented in a serious fashion yeah and the interviewer isn't asking i mean sure the questions are scripted but it's not as a nothing happening as the vince mcmahon era questions were 
It's all working really, well, really well. And and also at the same time, it's more adult, more serious because it's the Triple H and this guy, head of production. What's his name? Do we even know who this guy? We remember they announced Kevin's replacement. I can't remember his fucking name. He's from ESPN. That's all I remember. Well, at any rate, it's Triple H's idea of wrestling and a major sports television guy's idea of television, which is better than Vince McMahon's cartoon idea of childish wrestling that he was, you know, wallowing in for so long. And Kevin Dunn's vision is whatever Vince's vision was. And that's how he was trained. That's what wrestling was supposed to be. That's why, you know... That's why Kevin Dunn. So this is a whole new game here. And they they did commercial free for the first hour. And thankfully, because I don't want them to take commercials during the bloodline segment. And this way it could go 35 minutes from beginning to end without any interruptions. But the the rock comes out. And the people go crazy, and you can assassinate his character in a second. But they cheer, and they chant Rocky. And they go, because he's a movie star, and he's the biggest wrestling star, and he's in their midst, and it's Brooklyn, right? But then they've, and you've talked about, he's doing so much babyface stuff, and the people like it. He did a heel promo here. They like him, but... They worked this thing to the point where the people are interested enough in the in the story that they they will boo the rock whenever he knocks Cody or the Cody crybabies. And so Cody still has some life. It, and and also part of them, I'm sure, are working with this a little bit because they know what the responses are supposed to be, but they're interested enough to work with it instead of sitting there on their fucking hands like they've done for so long for so much stuff up there, like we have too. And he does the heel promo. I made that boy bleed. And he's so quick that when they what him, he can make it fit and he can get a boo at the end. So, and and you can tell that Rock is loving this. He loves, he knows the field is wide open. This is goddamn, this is Sir John Gielgud in a high school play at this point, right? And he's having a ball he showed the video on what is the the video thing the kids do chit chat tiktok tiktok yeah whatever it is well they showed video of kids crying over him beating up cody and he got shit bleep twice and I just, I just enjoy it because it's nice to be able to, if they're, if they're only going to show us talk and that's what they've been doing for quite a while, at least now they got a bunch of talkers and 15 minutes in, he does the, finally, the final cut boss has come back to Brooklyn and he didn't come alone. And now we get Roman and Paul and Jimmy and solo sounds like a Beatles tribute band. But they come in, and Roman does a great promo. Where his family above all, I'll do anything for the for family. And he thanks The Rock for, you know, for what he did and putting this whole thing together. And they're going to smash the fools in the tag match. And they're going to have their way with Cody on Sunday. And, you know, just unobstructed promos from two of the biggest stars in the, in the business on the show this coming weekend, the shows, plural, this coming weekend. And I like, Roman gave him a little bit for the, for the smart fans. He said, you know, when we all started making wrestling cool again a few years ago, Cody was off doing a whole lot of nothing. But when he saw what I was doing, he wanted to be involved. It's and so interesting one, they keep. Go ahead. It's so interesting they keep going back to that phrase because when AEW was first announced, that was the phrase they were using. Yeah, <laughs> wrestling is cool again. Well, and and it was very prophetic because I can't think of a cooler wrestling promotion that has cooled off any more <laughs> than AEW. So you you see they're they're calling these shots, and one would think that when he said you know. He talked about Cody, it would be Cody's music, but it was Seth's music. And here comes Seth Franklin Rollins to the ring. Well, not to the ring, 
but he comes out from the stands because he's that way you got to fight all of Brooklyn if you're going to attack me. And he was more serious than usual here, which you got to be in this situation with the, he's working with the rock and this is the WrestleMania main event. So he's still doing the, the drawl in that Seth freaking Franklin, whatever the fuck does, but he was more serious. And this is when he's good. And, you know, basically the talk is over. They, they crossed a line last week and he made a challenge for that night, Brooklyn one-on-one -on -one, Seth versus the rock. And it got a big pop. And he said, or it could be me and Roman got an okay pop. And he left it up to pick it, pick the stipulation, pick the one who's got the balls. And the fans are chanting Rocky, Rocky. And again, why not? By God. You mean we get to see Rocky wrestle and advertise, but in the Rocky responds, well, you, you don't want any of any of me or any of Roman. And Solo steps up. Yo, Seth, you ain't fighting them. You're fighting me. And it was kind of a, a light spreading of letdown booze. Did you hear that? It was like, ah, because let's face it, you know, poor Solo in that position. They'd rather seen their mother hooked up to a machine than see Solo instead of the Rock and Roman. But anyway, and then Rock added that it was bloodline rules. And they did 35 minutes. And they promoted the not only WrestleMania, but the main event at the end of the show uh, to, and you know, you just know something's going to happen later on, don't you? But that was a quest. That was a pitch back to me. That's what that was. That, that was a that was a question yeah. that was being asked to you. I didn't Mr. realize. Soli, huh. Mr. Soli, Mr. Soli. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Did did, then, did uh, I did I ever tell you that the one time, uh, the, the we were pre-taping the TBS show on Sunday night, but it was a a, a weekend where there was going to be a pay-per-view that night. So in, and Jim Ross was going to be on color, so he couldn't be in Marietta. It's at 6.59 p.m. and fucking wherever at 7 p.m. So they had me and Gordon Soley do the commentary on the taped TBS show. And I'm thinking, this is great. I get to do commentary with Gordon fucking Soley, right? And if this was 1989 or 90 or whatever, but he still had the voice. He wasn't that motivated. Might have been imbibing a bit. But me and Gordon Soley is great. So the very first match... I can't remember who it was. I can't remember what it was, but I asked him a question and it was within the, the realm of commentary. It was like, well, Gordon, have you ever seen a uh, you know, move like that in your years or whatever the fuck it was? It was just an innocuous question in commentary. And he gave me the side. eye and just kept going right on talking about whatever was going on. And then when we finished that match and went down in, in black for the break, he said, don't ask me questions. It throws me off. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I got along with Freddie Miller so well. Yeah. <laughs> he said nothing. <laughs> so I, I, the rest of the show, I didn't ask him any questions. And he didn't tell me any lies. But anyway, the, the announcers came out of this segment with why would Seth Rollins offer this seemingly right before these you know, big matches this weekend, seemingly dangerous offer for Seth. Why would he do this? So we know something's going to go on. Your your comments. Can't add too much to what you said. Excellent segment. The Rock was great. The a bloodline, just the feeling. It all felt real major league. And uh, it sticks in my head because I just watched Dynamite. But <laughs> it felt just like such a big deal. The crowd was eating it up. Even the Rollins thing, as lame as it was, the energy in the room, it felt like a big deal. You knew did more you, did you see? Did you see the one guy trying to get on camera when Seth is in the stands and surrounded by the fans? The one guy was trying to, well, I think he was trying to take a picture, but he went down in front of Seth and you see him holding his phone up or whatever. You see this guy in the black security guy, he runs past Seth and yanks this guy. Don't get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so they can take the shot. But great opening segment. 
And and it's it's happy it's again when you look at this and you're just the average person, which is who they're appealing to now. They've got their audience hooked, but they want everybody to watch WrestleMania. You see this big building in Brooklyn with fifteen thousand people in it, this network production, and all of these people are going batshit over what's going on with these talents and in the ring or on the microphone or whatever. And if if it doesn't appeal to you at this point, it's almost like well, you're saying, what's the matter with me? All these people are going crazy, and it's a, it's New York City, it's fucking NBA arenas, and blah, blah, blah. As opposed to being in NBA arenas that are 20% full in Saskatoon. And uh, then we went back, unfortunately, to the wrestling. And the Judgment Day, all four of them had an eight-man tag match with New Day, why don't they make one team drop the day, have the match of the days for the name of the day or a, 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 a name of a day with a Y in it or something like that? Can we get rid of one of the days? Can someone come out the day? That'd be something. Day -o, day -o. <laughs> That's not how it goes, but yeah. Well, he works on the banana boat all all night long, or is it all night long or all day long? Did we settle that? Well, again, you're you're mentioning parts of the song, but none of this is actually how the lyrics flow. We're talking about the flow of things here. Well, speaking of flow, let's get back to the sewage. So the Judgment Day wrestled New Day and DYI in the or do your is that do yourself in? D I D do it yourself. DIY. Man, is who they are. If one of those guys ever gets popped for anything on the road, they're done. DIY and DUI. D I, you know, just it'll kill them. That would be the headline. That would be the headline. Yeah. Well, a judgment day one. So fortunately, <laughs> DIY aren't going to be in the headlines. And, uh, hey, well, go ahead. What no, I was going to say, in case you just wanted to get all the Judgment Day stuff out of the way right now, just um, I admire that they take their darts everywhere they go. <laughs> <laughs> they always have darts set up, and then people are always playing it right next to everyone else. It's the smallest, most cramped party. See, that's the thing is I've just started skipping through the the Judgment Day in their clubhouse because it's so... it. It hurts the judgment day. I don't want to see Rhea like that. It's just nonsense. Cause they're 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 doing their own, you know, in planning meeting on television for okay, you're gonna take out so and so and you're gonna handle are you gonna handle this? Well, I'll handle that. What the fuck? And then Rhea, who goes from like, I'm Rhea bloody Rhea, is all of a sudden like, guys, I'm really concerned about yes. everything. You yes, don't want to see that. I'm very concerned. I'm clutching my pearl necklace. <laughs> Uh, well, in this uh, context here, let me ask you this question. He's still Mr. Money in the Bank or whatever. He has the briefcase. I guess he is Mr. Money. Yeah, Senior yeah, Money in senor. the Bank. Senior. If Cody wins the belt because he's running out of time to cash in, that would make you think that if, again, this is all big if, that if Cody won the belt, Priest would be one of the first things up for Cody just because they have to get that briefcase out of the way before the end of the year. Has the way Priest has been booked for the last few months made you excited for that? Oh, no, I haven't even thought about it once. Um, and I'm thinking that, well, who, let's see, who's going to have Seth or Drew? They, at this point, they, they're going to feed Priest to either Drew or to Cody to just get beat because they've got to get the case, right, before the end of the year. Have they ever... Maybe that's the angle. Maybe he's still going to have the case and hadn't cashed it in, and they say, well, you, you know, you lose it now. No, I've still got it. And you have two guys with cases, and they start fighting with each other. And then they put the cases on the pole. Uh, they're going to feed Priest to either one of the two champions because how can they not? Because he won't be taken seriously. I don't. Maybe it'll be a a big Raw match or a SmackDown, or maybe they'll put it on a pay-per-view that has... A, a strong card, but uh, no, there's no reason for anybody to be excited about Priest at this point wrestling for any, either of the world titles because nobody believes he's going to win them because he's been in this group of maladjusted dumb fuckery. Does that answer your question? 
Indeed. The maladjusted dumb fuckery. Could that be the, a, a new faction? It probably will be on some mud show somewhere. There's the troubled young team of maladjusted dumb fuckery. Would you like me to move on? Some would say that's us, but yes, please move on. Sammy and Gable. And now, yeah, I don't know if, if they're going to keep doing more of this stuff. I would love for them to keep doing more of it. Because under the, the dirty old man, we had shorty gable we had shoosh boy gable we had a fucking complete idiot right now we got a serious guy and they did a video where gable is and sammy are training at the performance center gable is the coach he's motivating sammy he's he's putting him through physical exercise putting him through training in the ring and he's trying to motivate him and it 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 worked, except for the the cheesy music throughout this whole thing, which I could have done without, and the melodramatic backbeat. Gable was good. He's serious. He can talk. He's an athlete. We saw he and Gunther's one of the best matches they had all year. And and Sammy, think about when I had Steen and Generico in Ring of Honor, I thought Steen was the talker. But what Sammy's done over the last year, of course, he, you know, it was hard for him not to be when the other guy was a fucking mute. But over the last year, Sammy Zayn is a better talker than Kevin Steen, who's his smart Alex stuff and the temper thing that he had him do is old or eh. And Sammy, you believe the shit he's saying, and so, even in some of these completely preposterous positions, you feel like this guy's stressed out and losing his mind over this shit. And Sammy's afraid of letting the fans down and himself down and his family down. But Gable's pumping him up. And it was, you know, they wouldn't pay to license Rocky. At least, da -da 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 -da. But otherwise, but yeah, I'm glad you, you tipped me off to this early that they were actually treating this like they were grown adults. It caught me by surprise, too. It was such a well-done video. Gable is being presented perfectly <laughs> all of a sudden in these videos and in this stuff with Sammy. And this is the best stuff Sammy's done in a while. And it just kind of snuck up on me. Well, and then they had the match with Sammy and Bronson Reed and the rematch. And Sammy's finally, I mean, they had a good match. We're not going to go blow by blow into it because let's face it. It's still, we, we, we want to see the angles, folks. Sammy was about to win, and Gunther from the entranceway drags Gable out in a fucking limp dish rag type of way, uh, drags him out and, and leaves him in the entranceway. Well, Sammy jumps out and goes and runs to help Chad up, and Gunther's left, but Gunther comes back and jumps on Sammy and beats the shit out of him back and forth all over the entranceway. And every time he goes to leave, Sammy won't stay down. And he's Sammy's doing the fucking baby face thing where he's boom, boom, trying to put his hands in under him and get the people going. And he fights to his feet and Gunther comes and levels him with the fucking title belt and walks off again. And while this feisty little underdog, Sammy can sell and you, you feel for him. You feel for him. You think you love him. Sammy you know, Zane, let me love you, let me love you, Sammy oh, Zane. Just stop, oh, oh, just stop. I'm, I'm, you're making I'm a sorry. fool of yourself this time. I got, I got carried time. away. I Even you know away. it. Even you know you're making a fool of yourself. What I was going to say is, a week before Mania, they really got me to care now to see Sammy versus Gunther. Because that was, miss that was missing this entire build for me, at least. He's still not going to win now. I hope he don't win, because we got bigger fish to fry with Gunther. But, you know, it, it's going to be a good match. I think I called that going to be one of the better matches when we previewed everything last week. Were you snapping your fingers over there? No, I, my pen. I got oh. My pen, see here. I was capping my pen because I had no further notes to make. All right. Did you see the official announcement of the induction or indictment? She's had both. Of Leah Maivia, the first female wrestling promoter. <laughs> 
That was a quote. Give me a break. <sighs> to be inducted by The Rock at the Hall of Fame. Um, she was the first female wrestling promoter in the state of Hawaii. Christine Jarrett beat her as a promoter by about 12 years and had, at that point in time, 37 years total in, in the wrestling business. <laughs> Eileen Eaton may have been in name only. She wasn't in the goddamn locker room giving the boys their finishes, but that goes back to, what, the 60s? And Gunkel beat her. And Gunkel was 72 to 74 with a uh, not well-received return in around 87. And we can't forget the illustrious Miriam Springfield down in Tupelo in 1982. But otherwise than that, and a few other people whose names we aren't even mentioning, Leah Maivia was the first female wrestling promoter. Again, it's the WWE Hall of Fame, so you try not to go too crazy because it's not, you know, you can argue about what is a Hall of Fame and what isn't. This is really just, let's give certain people a gift. It's not Cooperstown. It's you're not saying. Cooperstown. And Cooperstown's not even what it used to be, but it's not even that. And Liam Iv. Cooperstown used to be a place you could get laid with a fucking. For anyone who doesn't know about wrestling history, let me just say, Liam Iv is in no way a Hall of Fame wrestling promoter. She was not a trailblazer. There is no one who followed that trail. <laughs> She's not a trailblazer and, no, no, in no, any no, that, way. It was the end of the road, wasn't it? That was the end of the road. You know, there's a great book. It's it's just a fantastic book. It's still available that, uh, before he passed away, Ed Francis did, called 50th State Big Time Wrestling. And it's all about the history of wrestling in Hawaii under Ed Francis, who bought it from Al Karasik. And later, after they brought it back and things weren't working out, Peter Maivia obviously bought in with his wife. And when Peter Maivia died, Leah Maivia, the Rock's grandmother took over. And Francis writes in a book, yeah, we came back to Hawaii and we got like messages from Liam Ivia threatening us. Threatening Ed Fra Gentleman Ed Francis. <laughs> Liam Ivia was threatening him for just being in Hawaii. You better not try anything. You better not, you know, open up. You better not do anything. <laughs> she really thought it was like a territorial thing, but the difference is, other than the threats and the actual violence that could come from the threats, there was nothing promotional there was no promotional muscle behind it. Her and Lars Anderson, as a name forgotten in this story, as people are telling it, weren't lighting the world on fire. No. no. In Honolulu. And, and, I mean, and now, to be fair, they still had names for the first couple of years to come in because of the respect and connections that Peter Maivia had had. And the connections and the, and the flights. That's yeah, what it and, was. And the, and the fact that a lot of guys wanted to get paid something to go to Hawaii for, you know, for free. But no, it was this was not the glory period. And and the thing is also this was not a business that she started, as you said, it was a failing business that her husband had bought and she inherited. And that was the end of uh, when she went out of business, so did local territorial wrestling in the state of Hawaii. So uh, Hall of Fame career, I'm not sure, you know. Uh, I would have voted for Mrs. Springfield. There's two ways to look at it, too. One is The Rock wanted his grandmother in the Hall of Fame, which, again, you know, you, you could say she's in your grandmother Hall of Fame, but this is a wrestling Hall of Fame. How are you supposed to take it seriously? This is like putting in Vince McMahon's driver, James Dudley. They did that. They did that, I hey, know. I, that year, I had to ask. Me, who uh, was having to tell everybody in the studio who some of these people were when they would induct them in, in terms of the historical wrestling figures. And when I heard that announcement, I asked Bruce, I said, who's James Dudley? I had never heard that name. They called him Manager Extraordinaire. And he said it was Vince Sr.'s limo driver. They were very close. And I said, how was he a manager? And he said, back in the early 60s, when Bobo Brazil was the top guy in Washington, D.C., because the African-American population, Vince Sr. would send James out to get Bobo's jacket so he could get a round for, of applause from the crowd. Okay. Exactly. This is a gift. This is a gift thing for The Rock. So the question is, did The Rock ask for it? Or did Triple H strategically, because they keep saying this is Triple H's first year of picking the Hall of Famers, did Triple H strategically <laughs> say, I'm going to give The Rock a win here 
and I'm going to put his grandmother in the Hall of Fame. That'll make Dewey happy. To, to get The Rock to do the induction speech for their broadcast. That's right. Who else at this point? Rocky Johnson's already in. Who else would uh, Peter Maivia's already in. He could have, Rock could have inducted his daughter, but she's she's not going to be in for a couple more years. She's already in management. So anyway. Is this a redeemable thing if they do an angle during the Hall of Fame, during the Rock speech for Liam Ivea? They do some kind of angle. <laughs> the, the baby faces come out and bust the plaque over Roman's head? Let me tell the truth about his family. Yeah, that's something like that. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I th- That one will probably be angle-free if I had my... Yeah, me too. But the WWE Hall of Fame, anyone can get into it except Jim Cornette. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to put your driver in before they put you in. That's a bridge too far. Oh, everybody knows I always drove myself. <laughs> and then they had a girls tag team match. And then the Drew McIntyre video did by the coffin. Did you see it? I did. Drew McIntyre is there by a coffin. It looks like he's, you know, at a funeral. And he turns to the podium where they give the eulogies. And he says, Look in my eyes. What do you see? CM Punk has no match in Philly. <laughs> this guy's great. Have they been hiding this under Vince McMahon? Thought he's a Scotsman. He's got to have a goddamn sword. And that's the extent of it. You know, and I just watched the uh, Roman Reigns biography, and I know we're going to talk about that likely on the experience, although there's so much stuff happening. Yeah, we'll but, see what's hey, going hey on. let me say this publicly, as in in front of people. But with all the things going on this week, I know that Heyman was involved with the Roman Reigns biography. I want to give it my undivided attention. It's a couple hours long, so I'm not going to just zip through and get highlights. I'm going to watch the whole thing. We'll talk about it when I've had time, so we're not sloughing that off. We're trying to give it respect. But much like Drew McIntyre, Roman Reigns was someone that Vince McMahon saw as a project. And they were saying what, you know, suffer and suck attached. They were saying things that Vince McMahon thought would work, and it really didn't. Now he's not just some guy coming out with a sword. Now he's showing you attitude like a real person. Like the kind of attitude you would get if you bumped into him in the grocery store or something. Yes, and and he's, but he's witty, and he's wry with it, and he's not... Again, he's a perfect tweener, which they haven't had in a long time, and also which is a newsletter or smart fan, you know, of, of modern day of verbiage invention. But a guy that's in between, he's neither baby faced nor heel because of this change in attitude, and it's a slow thing rather than just stabbing a baby face in the back and you're hugging him all the next week, all in the heel locker room. Um, but he did a eulogy for Punk's WrestleMania dreams and some wicked shit and then skewered Seth and talked about his match and said he's going to put him down for good at WrestleMania. The, and, you know, he's great with this. So that's a, a Drew McIntyre has been elevated in the last year from we didn't particularly care if he was on a show or not to now he's one of the highlights that we can't skip. In just the last six months, not even a year. Yeah. So there you go. Good stuff. Again, it's it's the stuff around the wrestling. <laughs> and yeah. the fans are into the wrestling. It's not like they're sitting there bored. They they you know the eight man tag match. You know they want to yell at Dominic. They're into the Judgment Day stuff with our truth or whatever. They're not bored. It's just that stuff doesn't accept me. But all the angles and all the now the video packages are starting to get even better. Yeah, and and like you said, they're not shitting on most of the matches. Uh, but at at the same time, they understand. Well, you know, we're gonna see this match, and then uh, then here come the stars. So the next match was Ricochet versus Ivan the Viking. And then we sat until the ten o'clock hour, and out came Becky Lynch. I like the match, by the way. Well, I'm sure it was a good match. But it was a good that's, match. That's the thing. It's that, well, I was actually it, impressed by the Viking. I had never really paid attention to him. Like, right opponent, maybe? No, they, they, were, really they were great. Both him and his partner who was hurt, they were great when they were real people and, and the tag team war machine, and they could move for those big guys, but now they're Vikings. and, and But, you know, that's the thing. A good match, <laughs> but it's between 
people that are not being featured. So you'll sit and enjoy it. It's not offensive to the business, but we got bigger fish to fry here. The stars are about to come out again. And that's the philosophy they're taking. And maybe if one of these guys suddenly, you know, breaks out and gets over and people are jumping up and down and screaming instead of being polite and cheering and excited at the big moves, but just to see this guy or that guy or the other guy, then they'll, they'll let him quit wrestling and start talking. And then they better be able to talk because if they can't, they're going to go back to wrestling. And we know that's a path to fucking nowhere. Anyway, speaking of talking, Becky Lynch came out talking, but she came here looking for a fight. That's the same thing Seth said. Seth said in the stands, I came here, I, the time for talking is over with, I'm looking for a fight. Who's going to fight me? Well, she says, I came here looking for a fight. Should she and Seth, as a married couple, be in some kind of counseling for anger management? No, it sounds like they're peas in a pod. Well, yeah, but that sounds like a explosive combination to share the same house but anyway becky called Rhea out we're gonna fight right now and instead pierce came out and brought a whole phalange of security guards with him so that they don't jeopardize the big wrestlemania match with this tomfoolery and shenanigans and nonsense please leave becky respectfully please leave but suddenly Rhea's music it plays, and out she comes, and Adam says, save it for mania, and Rhea chucks the title belt at Pierce and then does a fucking zigzag and blows past him, blows through all ten of the security guards, and hits the rig, and they have a big fight and a pull apart. It was short, and it was good. In the, Unlike most of the girls' stuff, these girls don't work like girls. They work like guys. They have intensity, and it didn't go on forever where you would think it was ridiculous, although I would think that some NFL team would be interested in Rhea Ripley if she can get through 10 full-grown men that quick, don't you? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Because, I mean, boom, 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 you know, the, the broken, it looked like Marcus Dupree there. Marcus Dupree, there See? you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. He was a big deal still in Louisiana when I was down there. I apologize if you hear gardeners in the oh, background. Oh, God damn it. They're not mine. They're not mine. They're not mine. <sighs> and Can, then you, hear we had Can a... you hear them? No, I can't hear them. I've never heard them. It's like the buzzing of flies. <laughs> you know, have you had a CAT scan lately? No, but uh, maybe I can set one up. Well, I understand. A, 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 a cat scan. If you if you've got if you've got a cat, I know somebody can scan it. But then they had a girl six man tag team match, and then, um, they we were time for the main event, or it was time for the we were time for the main event, and on the way to the ring, in the back, as you mentioned, one of the new production pieces. The uh, Seth is going to the ring and they're following him and he passes Drew McIntyre just sitting there lounging around on an equipment case. And they faced off and exchanged some words. What, what was it? Uh, oh, God damn. Something like uh, Seth said to Drew, said, I'm not dead. And Drew said, yet. And then Seth goes on out for his his deal. And I was I was worried about this main event because Solo is, is doing a great job. He's he's working hard, but his matches are not. I, he doesn't need twenty or thirty minutes with a fucking top guy because it it tends to get somewhat redundancy repeated redundantly, right? He's doing this kind of the same basic stuff most of the time. So I was a feared of this when they jump started it a hundred miles an hour and they had 20 minutes left on the air. I'm like, Oh shit, this is going to take a while. But three minutes into the match was the first time that they actually got into the ring. It was to set up a table because by this is bloodline rules. So I, I say, you know what? With all these things considered, I'm skipping to the finish, but I didn't have to skip as long as what I thought I would. And by the way, the break spot was, uh, they broke that table. 
But don't worry. Because by the time they got to the finish, they'd pulled out and set up another table so we could see it again. And Seth powerbombed Solo through the table, but suddenly Jimmy Uso came in and super kicked Seth. And then Jay came out to fight Jimmy. And Brian, I know you'll never guess this in a million years. I know you saw it. But can you tell the people what the Usos did? They fought off, which you usually don't see in WWE. They fought off. <laughs> they just fought off. They got in a fight. They immediately went out the back door. And they were gone for whatever goddamn period of... They were gone. But meanwhile, Seth and Solo stayed out there. And then... No, wait a minute. I'm sorry. They fought off, but then Jay flew back out. Because there was the Rock. And Rock had thrown Jay out the door. But then Rock went to the ring... And then you didn't see. There you go. Anyway, the point is, Rock goes into the ring to get Seth, and then Seth starts smiling at him. And that's when Cody's music plays, and Cody hit the ring and beat the shit out of the Rock. And Seth and Cody were bouncing the Rock off the table. And Cody hooked him up and was going to go to Rock Bottom him on the announce desk when Roman saved the day and pulled him down, but Seth got on Roman. And then Roman posted Seth, and then he posted Cody. And then the fans started chanting for Punk. And boy, if Punk was still healthy, that would have been a heck of a thing, but they've still got that in the future. And then Roman Superman punched Seth and speared Cody, and I'm just, where did Solo go? Because Solo had been gone for fucking five minutes at this point. And where are the security that we established that we had earlier that came out to separate two women? But when this goddamn chaos is taking place, and what happened? And then finally, the heels shook and hug over the fallen baby faces, and then Rock whipped Cody with the weight belt, and then whipped Sol or Seth, and then... Roman wailed away on him with lots of bleeping, and then Solo finally came back and held Cody, and The Rock whipped him, and Rock said, fuck your story, and we went off the air with the fans chanting, Rocky sucks. But I, I hate to nitpick, because I love this shit. We got violence again. We got some profanity. We got some edge on this thing. We're seeing some blood every now and then. But I just, I still hate it when people just... It went too long. It, it, it goes too long, and people disappear for long stretches. And pieces of logic that we have established in the earlier part of the program don't apply to a later part of the program. There's security there. They were ready to pull the girls apart. Why wouldn't they try to stop this? There's... So I, I, I like the action and what they're trying to do, and obviously they're heating up WrestleMania like crazy, and the modern fans are more used to this than you and I are, Brian, because they've never seen logic thrown into a lot of these things, but it would be a, a bigger scene of chaos if, if people just didn't disappear, and I assume Solo, or I mean, the Usos at least could disappear, but I assume that Solo was just laying there for minutes at a time till he was needed. But if people were all involved and people were trying to stop it, even if they were ineffectual in doing so, it would add to the pandemonium of, of the scene. But otherwise than that, boom shakalaka. All right. And that was Raw. Strong ending. Strong ending for the go-home show for WrestleMania. I thought it went too long. Uh, this is two weeks in a row where the baby face just gets the shit kicked. Or in this case, they, yeah. two of them, get the shit kicked out of them for they, minutes on end. They got to kick a little shit back this time, but then they got the shit kicked back in their face. So that's Raw, and boy, was it. And perhaps, Jim, coming out of Raw, you want to listen to some good music or a podcast or two. The Gardener's killing me. The, oh, for this, heaven's sake. It's just st strong buzzing in the background. Maybe the strong... Well, and 
Again, we talked about don't eat the brown CBD, Brian. That buzz would go away. Is there a buzzing in your hedgerow? Anyway, I'll tell you what. There's you a budrow in my hedge. There's a budrow in your hedge. It's just a spring clean for the May Queen. But if you, ladies and gentlemen, would like to stick something in your ears so you don't hear the constant buzzing, or potentially if you'd like to just disguise the sounds of real life and the actual existing world that are going on around you and program your own soundtrack, well, I think there's no way better to do it then with the Raycon Everyday Wireless Earbuds. As a matter of fact, Stacy just got a new pair. They just came in the mail yesterday because she likes to keep restocked. Uh, you know, every once in a while, she accidentally takes one of these things out. Normally, they're in there 24 hours a day, so she can't hear me. That's what it's come to. But she takes one of them out every once in a while when she you know, takes a shower or whatever. And every once in a while, one of them will roll down between the couch cushions, so she keeps a couple of pairs around just in case, and just got a new pair. They've got the optimized gel tips. They fit perfectly in the ears, as I believe I mentioned. The thing you can do if you just like to help people out is just walk up behind people on the street and just stick a pair of these in their ears, tune to a, a melodious piece of music or something they might want to listen to, and just watch the look on their face, Brian. When these things get shoved into their ears and they're 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 overjoyed, they're overcome with emotion. They're really they're overcome with the, with all manner of emotions that you'd be so kind as to do that. Well, no, of what, course, what? of course, you're not going to do that to anyone. You buy Raycons for yourself. You stick them in your own ears. Well, you no, but you can give them ears. for gifts. Are you are you against? You gift can gift? give them in their box sealed as well, gifts. I, I don't know whether you ought to be able to stick something in somebody's box without asking them first. You're not sticking anything in anyone's box. You're getting a sealed box from Raycon. You're taking that sealed box. You're delivering it as a gift to someone you like. I would think, and they're opening it on their own, going, "Oh, I can't wait to see what it is." Well, they know what it is. It's just cellophane. But whatever, they're getting inside and they're excited about the earbuds they're going to be placing in their own ears and removing from their own ears at will. <laughs> the consensual removing or move or intruding or protruding or the insertion, consensual insertion of earbuds, courtesy of the Raycon Everyday Wireless Earbuds. And it says here, remember to take them out for any CAT scans. Yes, do not have a CAT scan with the Raycon Wireless Earbuds. Unless, actually, if you put on the awareness mode, could you wear them? Because then you'd be aware of the surroundings. Well, I guess maybe it would cross the wire. That's why they tell you to turn your cell phone off when the plane takes off, right? So don't have a CAT scan while wearing the Raycon wireless earbuds because it could catapult you into another dimension. But otherwise than that, it's okay. Because they got three customizable sound profiles, and they've got the tap functions right there on the earbuds where all you have to do is tap them don't tap them too hard they're in your ear you give yourself some kind of concussion and you can completely block out all outside distractions with the noise isolation mode but be aware that there may be tornado activity in the area when you're doing that because elsewise you might end up flying across downtown poughkeepsie be aware if there's Tornado yes, activity. Yes, okay. it, in good The way weather, you phrased it, you made it sound like this will cause the tornado activity. Well, no, they're still working on that. They're not that, working on that. It. Well, that, that would be the extra added button that they're coming out with, the weather-altering mode. But they haven't got that patented yet. But folks, eight hours of playtime, a 32-hour battery life, it sounds just as crystal clear as the voices you hear inside your own head. The Raycon Everyday Wireless Earbuds. And right now, if you go to buy Raycon, that's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash J-C-E, you're going to get 20% off your order plus free shipping. So if you want to get one pair or if you want to get multiple pairs and and have them inserted or give them for consensual insertion or self-insertion, if you've got a family or a close social circle of friends that are self-inserters that that insert themselves many times per day. Give them these everyday What earbuds. the hell are you talking about? You can get 20% off any number of 
of, uh, of, of, of earbuds here. So you can right. give them to everybody, you know, and then they can insert them. If they're people who insert or self inserters, you've got things to work through, but once again, Raycon, a wonderful solution for those. They go in your ears too. That's a, now I'm trying remember. not to use the word insert. Yeah. You, you can they, buy them and you can use them only in your ears. Only in your ears, just like we are right now. Jim, what's that promo code one more time? It's buyraycon.com slash JCE, 20% off and free shipping. They're going to ship them for free all the way from their factory straight to your waiting ears. No other orifices, just your ears.